difficulties, uh, you can message those to me as well uh, via your private messenger. Um, so with that, I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jay Solomon is a natural resources, environment, and energy educator. His expertise encompasses res residential radon and moisture management, statewide delivery of livestock manure and facility management programs, and management of a smart meter, smart grid grant funded state program. Jay Solomon brings an agriculture engineering perspective and background to help individuals and communities find healthy economical solutions to challenging issues. He further works with engineering, animal systems, consumer economics, and natural resources programming areas. With that, I'll let you take it away, Jay. All right, I will turn my back camera. Good evening, glad to have everyone here. Um, I see a few responses in the in the uh, chat there to uh, what species we may be looking at, but uh, I encourage you to continue to, to let me know on that. Um, kind of how makes a difference of where I might want to focus this and, and where we might go with it. So um, as Grant said, uh, you know, I've got a little bit of a varied background uh, coming at it from an ag engineering standpoint. Uh, and so I approached this grazing topic from both a livestock production standpoint and a environmental standpoint. So how do we, how do we make those two work together? And it's not as uh, uh, out there as some people might think it is and, and portray it to be. So uh, with that in mind, one of the places I got started in doing some of this stuff was uh, in the area of working with fencing and, and water systems. So thus the name, a fence is a fence, right? Well, if you look at the picture to the side, they, to the side you might question that. Um, but, what I would like to kind of hit upon tonight is uh, a little bit of why we talk about a fence uh, and looking at somebody who's getting started into this or at least backing up and going, okay, we're looking at livestock. We're looking at doing this uh, enterprise. Um, we're looking at having to do some fencing. What are the things we really need to think about and back off and start from and thinking about it? So why a fence? Let's talk about how we get design it for performance and a little bit on placement. Now, some of you in this group may actually have heard a few of my presentations, know that uh, there's a couple of those areas right there that we could talk most of the night on, but I will try to keep it light. So why a fence? Well, we all know they're not create equal. Um, some are better than others. And the things that we kind of try to measure that on for this audience is how it controls animals and kind of the human perception. Now, I always use this picture here, uh, or we use this one quite frequently, because people look at it and go, oh, what a mess. How could that be a fence? But as the owner of that pointed out, it's an interior fence. Um, it had been in use for a good number of years. Uh, one of the issues that's not obvious from the picture is that they've got a lot of deer pressure on it. And so it evolved into this over time. And until the board got dropped across it and they took the gate out of it on this side, um, it was still holding the cattle in and the deer were moving back and forth across it, knocking it, not knocking it down all the time. So functionally, it was still a fence. But the other side of this one was there's pictures later on where we actually show where they replaced that particular fence, which is why I happened to get a picture of it. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about the purpose of a fence. So if you're looking at a fence, what we often think about is they're used to define property lines. And from that standpoint, there's a certain part of visibility and whether it be the animals, people, uh, everybody can every everybody and all animals can recognize. Hey, there's the property line. There are a lot of people who are very concerned and and rightfully so, very concerned about the aesthetics of it. Such as the top picture here, where we've got uh, you know a nice wooden fence, very uh, something you think of very often around a horse facility, which is actually what that happens to be. Uh, so that's the aesthetic that they want to portray. The one at the bottom. They just wanted to portray that it was a good solid fence. 
and was functional, as we will talk about later. The key piece of this is you want to be able to keep the animals in a desired area. Um, and then in some instances, we talk about some of our smaller animals, um, you, may want to, you may want to exclude some animals out of it. That is unwanted animals, predators, or in some cases, we're trying to keep deer out of an area. So there we look at what is that purpose for that fence? So as we look at that, one of the pieces to start with is thinking a little bit about the different species. If we're talking about dairy cattle, and especially uh, the dairy cattle, the, the cows that are in the milking stream, they're usually fairly easy to keep in place. They just need something that defines the borders for them. Uh, most of the time, if there is some feed in front of them, they're not going to be trying to figure out where else to be. Um, they're not going, to, not going to wander too far from the, the milking parlor. Horses um, define need something that defines the area where they need to stop at. Needs to be something of a moderate deterrent, something they can see, something they realize, hey, that's uh, something I don't want to run into, um, and they'll push on it some. And in general, um, beef cattle again can be all over the place can be uh, uh, defined, basically needs something that defines the area. Um, needs to be a moderate to significant deterrent, depending on the nature of the cattle and, and where they've been worked with. Some of the show calves, they grew up as show calves and show cattle. They'll be pretty easy to keep in, very much like the dairy calves, dairy cattle. Uh, others, they're looking for a place to, looking for all the holes they're going to push push and test it everywhere they can. Sheep and goats, we need a significant deterrent. Uh, it needs to be designed for them because they're not viciously, but they're just looking for a way out, the opportunity to explore. And we also are looking for a predator deterrent, something to keep dogs, coyotes, uh, other animals out. So we're looking at it being both ways. So from that standpoint, that's where we think about what's the difference between the two of them and, and the species and how, what animals are we trying to keep in? That's why, again, not all fences are created equal. From a performance standpoint, point, things I'd like to talk a little bit about is building it for, for performance. Um, really thinking, again, about what the animal you're going to keep in there. What do you want it to do? What's the, what does the fence need to really do? Um, especially we talk about the difference between external and internal fencing. And then I'll hit upon the definition of legal, the, a brief piece on the legal description of fence, just so we all kind of have a starting place from it. So if we're looking at building mm -hmm. performance from a perimeter standpoint, the things we're probably looking for there is, again, defining that property line being visible creating a physical barrier to keep the animals in, um, creating a physical barrier to exclude unwanted animals, uh, in particular predators. Again, like I say, sometimes it's, we may be trying to do a deer fence. Um, should be thinking about things like easy maintenance and the aesthetic of it. Is it a nice looking uh, fence, and I'll talk a little bit more about aesthetic, another piece of that in a, in a, in a few minutes. Uh, as we think about that aesthetic is not only is it not only about the looks, but does it look substantial? Does it look secure? Does it look like a good fence? Interior fences, basically where we're doing subdivisions of it, they're really, their job is to regulate the grazing area. There can be as much of a psychological barrier as they are a physical barrier. Um, again, thinking about easy maintenance and flexibility, being able to change what that subdivision is seasonally and maybe even yearly. Uh, and what I think about this picture on the bottom is one I really uh, like to kind of allude to is that group of calves, uh, when we were walking on part of a tour, down the alleyway, they had been over in the very far corner of that paddock. They come running as a group up to up to where you see them there, 
And you see where they stopped at. They stopped a few feet from the fence. Because there were several people in the group. Oh, man, we're fixing to have all the cat, all of them right down here against us. They respected that. Um, so it's a psychological barrier, not a physical barrier, because there's no way you, those calves that hit that, they go right on through it. Um, it's also designed very flexible, used to polywire so they can move it around. So it's kind of meets all of those things in one shot. So before I get into a little bit more about building performance and some other pieces of this, let's talk about what that legal definition is. And I'll hit the high points here. If you really want to dig into the legal definition, uh, I would encourage you to access the, uh, the state statutes. Um, it's several pages long. But the key pieces that most people look at is it specifies it has to be four and a half feet high, which is 54 inches as a minimum, in good repair, again, my comment about the aesthetic, and suitable and efficient to prevent livestock from getting into adjoining lands of another. Both good repair and that's sufficient. So it needs to look like a fence. Um, and this applies most directly to your perimeter fencing. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep the animals on your property and not out on the road, not in your neighbor, not wandering around in your neighbor's yard, right? So that's the legal description of a fence. I often get asked that question, um, and those are the things that I look at. If we look at materials that, we, that they can be made out of, and I think one of the things I want to point out in that description is nowhere in there does it say it has to be a five-strand barbed wire or it has to be woven wire with two strands of barbed wire above it. It has to be sufficient to keep the animals in. And there actually is, and I didn't put it in there, there's a list of materials. It can be a stone fence, a wire fence, uh, panels, and several other things I actually put into the act or other materials that are sufficient to maintain that fence. So traditionally in this area, we think about barbed wire uh, using panels or some type of a woven wire like the bottom picture there. Uh, in a lot of cases where the, the classic fence is a four foot woven wire fence with uh, at least one barbed wire above it to make that 54 inch tall fence. But there are some other options to think about. And especially we look at some of the newer options out there that may give us some more flexibility uh, and some added benefits. Um, especially if we look at high tensile wire, which is newer smooth wire. Um, and the difference between it and the barb is we just need to pull it really good and tight. Um, and it's the structural part of it that, that uh, keeps the animals in, not the barb itself. Um, High tensile woven wire, which a good bit of the modern woven wire is high tensile wire. Um, situation is, it's easier to pull it tight and hold it tight. Uh, but there are some construction things that you can do with it, with high tensile woven wire that'll make it stay nice, smooth, and straight looking from the aesthetic standpoint and function standpoint a little bit better than some of the, the older systems, but you've got to allow it to move just like you do the high tensile fence, high tensile wire. Poly rail, uh, poly netting, poly wire, uh, those are all things that we can think a little bit more about as far as interior, although the poly rail is something we do talk about using for the top part of horse fencing and other types of fencing where we want that top fence to be really visible because that wire's got it's that rail has plastic in it and two contents of wires, one on either side of it, or in some cases, three, they have one through the middle. So there are options that are out there. I want to make you aware of those more than anything. So a little bit about perimeter fencing and kind of what we know from traditional dairy cattle, what we normally think about is a five to seven strand barbed wire or high tensile wire. Cattle, beef cattle, roughly the same. Um, and some of this has to do with having the multiple strands because you've got the different size animals. 
uh, with the dairy cattle, you need the upper two or three strands and one of the lower strands to keep the cow from deciding to walk in it. You need the lower strands to keep the calves in. Same thing with the beef cattle. Uh, sheep and goats, woven wire, six to 10 strand barbed wire or high tensile. Need more wires because they, they're smaller, they're able to work through uh, the wider spaced wires. Um, key thing with horses, top of it needs to be visible, it needs to be multiple strands. Um, they're not gonna try to duck under it. Now, I should caveat that as somebody pointed out to me that that is assuming that you're using, you're talking about standard horses and not some of the miniature horses. That's a whole different ball game. So if we're talking about, and we, Grant and I kind of thought a little bit about this might be some folks that were looking at some of the small ruminants, but uh, the situation is the same, whether it's small ruminants or, or other animals. If the perimeter, there's no perimeter fence out there or to start with, New fence, clean slate, there's a lot of options. You really could think about doing barbed wire, woven wire, high tensile wire around that exterior and create a really nice looking secure fence for those livestock and keeping them in. And you also can do things that would make it to where um, you could control predator, uh, predator predation as well. Um, high tensile wire, we'll talk a little bit about could be electrified, for example, uh, electrified and ground. By electrifying grounding part of the wires, uh, you can get it to where it will hold it, keep them, keep them in. If you got it, if the situation is you've got an existing perimeter fence, maybe it's not in the greatest shape, or you're changing animals that's being kept inside of it. You got a five strand barbed wire, and you're gonna try to run sheep in it. Um, we we'll make and modify those needs. A couple of things we could do. Add additional strands, add additional barbed wire or smooth wire strands within it. Or as this picture shows, uh, add an internal uh, electric fence uh, with standoffs in it. Will extend the life of that fence. If it's not able to handle all the pressure against it, um, you know, if the fence is good enough that it's pretty well there and it looks good, but maybe it can't handle a lot of pushing against it, this is a good way to keep some of the animals off of it by electrifying. The other one is to come in, and, and I've seen this with some sheep, they'll come in and sheep, and also with, with uh, chickens, they'll come in and put netting to the inside of it, electrified netting to the inside of the fence. Or there comes a point in there, if you're really thinking about it from performance and stand, uh, long-term standpoint, maybe think about, is it easier and actually long-term better to remove it and start over? Just because there's a fence there doesn't mean that that's the fence you need to stay with. Um, might be time to start over again. And I've had some folks have that discussion a few times. If we talk a little bit about barbed wire, uh, if we're trying to keep the some harder to keep in sheep, goats, for example, um, you know, we talk about 10 to 12 strands of wire. Now, not a fun thing to put together with a barbed wire. I, I understand that. That's one reason I will say, let's not talk too much about this. Your wire spacings become important because you don't want the animals to be able to go between them. You also can use that to keep some of the predators out of it. The other thing, the key thing to look at is how close those posts need to be in there to keep that wire straight. Now let's talk about, uh, and, woven, and then go to the next one is the other one, the woven wire. Um, this is fairly something fairly common we see out in the field right now, um, and we see along along uh, interstates, state highways, those kinds of things. It's kind of that standard fence. Um, it's really there to discourage the animals from from getting into it, but it's a lot of work to to put up. Um, one thing I will say, if you're in a, my note here, um, kind of forgotten what it meant, is that if you're looking at keeping uh, sheep and goats or small calves inside what they call standard field fence, which has got the really large uh, square openings in it or the rectangular openings in it, those can be large enough that the animals can get their head caught it, through, the, through it and get caught. So encourage you to go to the smaller options 
with the, with the wire, more strands in it, smaller smaller squares or rectangles being created by um, putting that protective strand, strand, protective strand at the top, whether it be bob wire, electrified high tensile wire, or just a, a, a electric or just a good high tensile wire properly installed, is is another option there. Again, very tight uh, fence post spacing, so that's a lot of work and a lot of uh, expense there. Here's where I think, and I'm coming to is the high tensile wire gives you another option and is a way to put up a fence faster with less materials and ultimately save money, usually in the labor side. Uh, cost wise, fairly close to the same, but not as much. Uh, there's not as much labor in putting it together. Still looking at uh, maybe 10 to 12 strands. If we're talking about keeping sheep in, we can look at it being, that's non-electrified. If we're gonna electrify it, we can use fewer strands. Um, you see the spacings in there that are kind of suggested, uh, and I can get into those if somebody's wanting to work with, with uh, sheep and need a little bit more information on it. Be glad to talk a little bit more about it. That's, that's another in-depth presentation about doing high tensile fence itself. We talk about the post spacing though, you can look at spacing those posts out on fairly level ground, 40 to 60 feet apart, or a little further as I've had some folks in practice do. But you need to come back in there and put good solid stays in there every 20 to 30 feet to keep those wires straight and just kind of help hold the fence up and give some de definition of where the fence is. One of the keys with building a new fence and especially high tensile fence or building a new uh, woven wire fence is how well you do the corners. This is where most fences fail at. Um, and this is an example of an H brace uh, fence that was put in uh, and it's a pretty nice one. Uh, actually, this one I believe is to NRCS specs. So it's the, it's, there's some research went into that, does meet the cost share specs for it, um, which does specify that that's gotta be, a, the two posts have gotta be a certain distance apart. Um, and, and some of those kinds of things based on how many strands of wire you got up against that, how big those posts need to be and how far that spacing is. But once you get it in there, you've got a good solid post, good solid corner. Um, and the deal with your high tensile wires, you're gonna pull those down um, to pretty tight, there, there's specs you're gonna pull all those wires down. And even with your woven wire, you wanna pull it good and tight before you tighten it up to the additional post. So having those good end posts is what makes it uh, really functional long-term. Here's an example of, and this is that same area where the, the, the uh, initial fence was. In fact, I believe the bottom picture is actually looking up that same, same draw where they came back in and put in uh, fence, and I, I hate that this one was a little bit gray and it actually looks like it's getting a little fuzzy now on me, um, but you see the solid wood post here, solid wood post here, uh, one here, and the other one I believe is right there, and you see they were using, in this case, one inch, fiber, one inch diameter, six foot fiberglass stays in between those, so they were actually able to space them out to that full 60 and in some cases 80 feet with those solid uh, stays, lightweight post is really what they became uh, in between. So you get them good and tight and then you bring the, the post in there. These can go up really quickly. Uh, and that's where your labor savings is, is about as fast as you can run the, the wire from one end to the other and tie them off and tie the tensioner here in and start tightening up is what it takes to put those put a fence like that in once you get the corner post and the few line posts you have to have in there put in. So you can also look at using some materials you already have. Here's an example of where they used, uh, they electrified high tensile wire and used existing T-post with it. Again, space it out. This is a case where you use good solid end post, a few wooden posts, 
come back in and put these in in place of the stays and you actually scoot them out a little bit wider uh, than you would the stays, full 30 feet, maybe a little bit more. You've got a good got a good post in between them to really make sure it maintains that line. And if something does hit it, it doesn't spread them too wide. Beauty of the whole system like this is if a deer comes through there and hits that top line, they're not going to snap the line and they're not going to pull it down. It's going to have enough give that it's going to give and let the, the deer go on over it and then snap back in place. A uh, weakness of this is that um, those T-post uh, um, insulators uh, do have a tendency to pop off. So you got to check them a little more often using the T-post. That's why a lot of times we discourage, discourage people from using uh, metal posts because, hey, they're going to ground out if you're electrifying. You increase your chances for grounding problems. So coming back to that discussion about sub, that's a lot of the discussion about perimeter fences, good solid built to hold the animals in. If we think about coming back to our interior fences, use kind of the same slide here, but looking at a couple of options here for uh, fencing, interior, uh, the other two are related to goats in this particular instance, where we're really creating a psychological barrier. Uh, and one of the things I want to point out with both of the pictures, the one in the bottom, one in the top, you notice how one side of it, they've it's already greened up. They were actually using the goats in this area to clean up some uh, briars that were growing, some, some uh, invasive species. Uh, trying to think what was, oh, poison ivy and some other things that were in there. And you see how well they cleaned up the things to the right side or to the left side of it, their preferred grazing is available on that left side, but they're still in the, they've stayed in that paddock. They have the respect for it. Uh, and part of that is just setting the system up right to start with. Um, again, things we're thinking about on that is we're regulating grazing areas. So if they do get out of it, they're still captured inside your pasture. They're just not in the area you really preferred they be grazing in. Um, something that's easy to maintain is definitely your advantage uh, in the flexibility, being able to move this from one year to the next, or even within the season uh, as things get dry, maybe you need to make those paddocks bigger. Or in a lot of cases, what we'll think about is early in the spring, early summer, when we have a lot of flush of growth, we may be making those paddocks much smaller for grazing and then make them larger to really get the efficiency out of it uh, or larger over time to get the efficiency out of it. Last piece I'd like to kind of talk about is placement. And I've alluded to a little bit of this already. If we're thinking about the perimeter piece and it's defining the property line, um, there is that discussion about shared fence and the state, state statute states that um, if it's a shared property line that each owner is responsible for half of the fence. Well, at this, it is still on the books, but there's been some interpretations of it. And what it comes down, really comes down to is as the livestock producer, you're the one responsible for keeping your livestock in. Um, and so it's led to some different interpretations of that. When the statutes were written, everybody had livestock or nearly everybody did. So everybody had a shared value or shared interest in having a good solid fence there. With all the fences having been taken out and all everything in cropland these days or open timber kind of gone away. So that's where I say, is it a shared fence? In which case you put it right on the property line. Or if you want to, or you can come back and put the fence in either right on the property line or just a little bit inside of that property line, six inches to a foot, just make sure you're inside of it. And that you put the end fence in, it's your fence. You get you can maintain it, you can design it and build it like you want to, uh, and and manage it and secure and, and ensure that it's always in good repair. 
uh, and that it does a sufficient job of, of keeping your animals in. Um, same thing with the pasture line. If it is the perimeter fence, put it right on the edge of that uh, area and think about, is that fence there as the actual barrier, the physical barrier, or is it just a, a physical barrier, but a more of a psychological barrier in that you don't want them out into maybe a crop field, but they're still, if they get in that field, they're still in your property because there's an external good solid perimeter fence out around the outside. Gives you an, uh, thoughts about what you might want to put in material into that in place to save a little bit of money. Maybe in a in a case like this, maybe using a four or five strand five strand fence in there might be sufficient. Uh, whereas you've done a multi uh, an eight strand around the outside. The last piece is that pasture line. If it's an interior fence, then we can talk about more of a internal psychological fence line in there, something that's easier to move. And in placement of those, um, makes a little bit of difference where we want to place those. If we're looking at those pasture lines in particular, and we've got a flexibility with it, look for the natural breaks. Upper land, bottom land, because they're going to grow a little bit different, maybe have different species in them. So being able to manage those as two different blocks keeps from overgrazing one area and undergrazing the other area. If you've got different soil types, same thing. Um, if you've got a stream running through it, you may want to uh, fence fairly close to that stream. So basically, since you fence it to one side across part of it so that the animals don't tend to cross the stream, as often they'll come up to the water because there's not any grazing on the other side. Maybe they'll cross, go, oh, there's nothing over here and not go back across. You don't have them in the water all the time. Do you have forage differences out there? Uh, changes in slope. So maybe you've got some bottom land or some flat ground and then it slopes upward or like the one here in the corner, like the picture here, you've got slopes and in one case when you've got one that is, uh, uh, east-west um, or north-south. This particular slope, I thought it was a really good picture that morning, it happens to be a uh, west-facing slope. Uh, obviously, the snow is on the north side. So you could run a fence right up that center line between the, between the grass and the snow side of it and actually have two different grazing characteristics in there and have paddocks that you can work with. Um, and there are other natural barriers that may be out there. Drainage way, um, fence line, or a, a timber line, those kinds of things. Look for those as being your natural breaks you would work with. And again, look at these, some of these as being your primary subdivisions and, and being able to redivide, redivide that uh, in the case of, and I'll back up, in the case of this particular picture, you'll notice there's a fence down the bottom here. So they have the bottom piece of this as one uh, and the top piece, the slope piece as the second paddock, they may actually come back here and divide this in, into two more paddocks uh, to be get better grazing out of it. Some of the basic principles, use your topography, your soil types, your forage differences is kind of your primary subdivision. The primary subdivisions should allow further subdivisions of it. So thinking about this as you're moving from one end, one is we're not fencing a pasture. And most times we want to be able to move those animals around into different pastures to get better utilization out of them. Not as one big paddock and let them graze the whole thing. And if you've got questions about that, I'd be glad to talk to me. That's kind of that next step in, in talking about grazing. Um, keep the paddock square as possible. And remember, flexibility is key to ultimate success with most of these. And why do I say square? Well, if you look at the most efficient from a material standpoint way to fence in, one acre, it's a circle. 
shortest distance, shortest fence, fewer posts, less wire. But I haven't got anybody just really enthused about doing a whole bunch of circle pastures. And if there's somebody on online here that wants to do it, I'd love to love to talk to you about it. So the next best one is the square. And you see how it progresses down as you change shapes, how your fence, the amount of fence required changes. Um, as you get to the two longer ones, not only does your fencing costs go up quite a bit, but your utilization changes um, most of the time. If you're talking about a very big paddock, um, the animals will tend not to go from one end to the other unless you give something to encourage them to do it. Kind of one of those pieces, and this is where I like to kind of remind people to think about it and to um, do a little education before you start putting fences together and, and look at what type you're using, um, what type of fence you're thinking about doing. Here we have a pair of insulators. Actually, I think it's the same insulator, two different shots, um, that's been put in on a high tensile wire. It's going to be electrified. Uh, well, actually, one side's electrified. The other side is tied to a post, so they, they wanted it non-electrified. Does this look correct to folks? I kind of hope by my note there that you have a suspicion that it is not correct. And in fact, this is installed essentially backwards to what it's supposed to be. Those two wires that are coming to that and going through those holes, in this case, are actually outside of each other. They should be forming a figure eight and should be interlocking when they're installed correctly. You want that to be in compression. In other words, those two points pushing against each other, not trying to pull the piece apart. Um, actually, I was a little bit concerned about getting too close to that to take pictures because they were tightening that up. And I'm like, this thing could blow up at about any time now. Kind of another one of those thinking about how you do it and knowing the system. Anything look kind of wrong to anybody here in this? Give you a second to look at it. Got a, got a wire running through here through a wooden post. So the two things that are not quite right about this particular one. One, they drove the steeple in really tight. And so that high tensile wire is not able to slide through there and move like it should um, because that wire is going to give a little bit and as you tighten it up, you need to slide through so that it tightens the whole system up. Um, and the other one is, even though it's a wooden post, that's a treated wooden post, it will siphon off some of your electricity um, short out, especially if it gets wet or it rains. So in this one, they used the, the plastic sleeve and they also, you notice the staple, the steeple is not driven in near as hard so that that wire has a chance to slide through a little bit and actually adjust as you tighten up the, the fence. One last piece on, on electric fencing uh, piece of this. Number one thing we see problem being with electric fencing and people saying, oh, I can't keep animals in. One, you got to get them scared of it before you start, or they got to get their get their attention so that they psychologically don't want to push it uh, to start with. If they basically walk up, hey, that that tangles a little bit, and they walk under it, then they're never going to respect the fence like you need them to. Um, what we normally see is an attempt to overcome poor grounding or poor electrical. Uh, performance of their fence, many farm, many producers will buy a larger charge. I've got, oh, I have to go buy a bigger, I have to run this, I've got one, I've got 10 acres, but I've got this, the biggest charge that I build out there. And most of the time, the problem is in the grounding of that one, of that charger. It's not grounded. So you, the whole deal with electricity, electric fence is how well you get electricity from the fence back to the charger. And the ground rods are what drives that. Need at least three ground rods, 10 feet long, driven in the ground, connected to the charger. The voltage drop between the last ground rod and an independent ground should be less than 500 volts. Somewhere around, preferable around 200, 200 volts. Um, and 
not something you would actually, there is a way to test that, but it comes back to what we see is with a single ground rod, you've got more than that kind of voltage drop, whereas you go with a minimum of three ground rods, and that's what nearly all of the new, uh, newer low impedance chargers will tell you is three ground rods uh, to get that performance. And that's a limit of what's covered in uh, one of the handouts, the why electric fences fail uh, sheet that we put together. Um, it's a few years old, but the content is still very solid. So kind of uh, going with the uh, sheep and goat theme, and some of you may have seen this one. Um, this was a electric sheep fence. And if you look down through there, you notice it looks a little uh, white. That's because uh, it's not a sheep fence. It's a wool puller. Um, basically, don't electrify barbed wire. Dangerous. It doesn't conduct electricity well. Uh, and it does, the wire is not designed to conduct electricity very well. And the points actually bleed off some of the electricity as it goes across. So it's hard to get good a good charge all the way to the other end of the fence on a consistent basis and getting a good shock to the animals out of it. So electrified barbed wire is a no-no. Something that we don't like to see, not really, not really a productive way to do it. In conclusions, I'd like to throw out there, and I, I noticed there's some pictures, some questions in the in the chat there. Um, consider the purpose of the fence. What animals are you trying to control? What other requirements might you have? Um, in particular, one of the things I think about that I haven't mentioned here, but on a fence, do you have other animals against it? Do you have neighbors that are maybe potential for trees falling against it, a lot of timber, uh, a lot of deer pressure, those kind of things make a little difference of what kind of fence you might think about putting up there and how you might construct it, which kind of the build for, for performance. Think about, is this a psychological barrier or a physical barrier or both? Um, and how can we have easy maintenance on it? And what I get at there, your high tensile like this one here where you're going through timber is much easier to maintain than even a high tensile woven wire. Because once something goes down against a woven wire fence, there's quite a bit of effort to get that straightened back out and get it back where it really maintains shape and, and the animal control that you would like for it to have. In thinking about placement, use the natural breaks that are out there uh, is a good placement to put those, but think about flexibility both in your initial subdivisions and on subsequent subdivisions. One other thing I will throw in here with this is in that ease of maintenance and performance piece is if you know you're going to subdivide it, think about where those posts are that you can tie or connect the cross connectors, connections to. Um, is another piece of that and how you put those in can make things a lot easier in that next step. So with that, I think I moved through this pretty quickly, but uh, hopefully got some questions out there and, and can answer some folks, answer for some folks. Sure. All right. Well, thank you, Jay. Thanks for that great overview. I know, especially we, we sometimes get the questions a lot in our extension office about fencing and, you know, every farm is sometimes so unique when it comes to their fencing needs and setups that it's 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 a very, um, it's such an important topic uh, to cover. Um, one of the questions that I see in the chat box, and you might have some other questions in yours, Jay, so please check. Uh, but the one that I see is, um, what is the recommended sheep goat perimeter fencing for renters? Um, if somebody's renting it and renting the property and you can't get the owners to put in a, put in a good fence, um, that is one of the, the areas that I would think about either 
it's a little bit hard to answer that question. I guess the thing to look at from that is what kind of goats are you working with and a little bit about what the area is and are you building right up against a road or something like that that is going to be an additional problem um, or concern, I should say. Um, but if there's an existing fence there, is there a way to improve it? Either looking at additional strands, putting electrical, the, the standoffs and putting some, like a couple, two or three strands of electric fence uh, to the inside of it. And preferably on a perimeter fence is putting two or three strands of, of high tensile wire in there because you pull it down tighter and you actually hold it more secure than you would with. And when I talk about high tensile, I'm talking about the 12 and a half gauge, not the, not the really small um, electric fence wire that's also high tensile, but uh, is a much smaller gauge uh, because it is a, by going 12 and a half gauge, it is a physical barrier along with a, a, the electric being the psychological barrier piece of it. Other option would be to look at doing uh, some of the, the, the netting, and particularly the, the poly netting uh, fence. Um, I'm going to back my slide set up here. and I think I can get back to it. Um, maybe the easier thing for me to do is go back to here. This slide, really doing something like this to the inside of an existing fence, um, is is one of the options. Um, and I've seen it in a couple of locations being used as the external piece as well. Um, really, again, it depends a lot on the location what the other extenuating circumstances. This does not work well. And if you look at the bottom picture, you see where it was a little bit of a hazard with it. They actually had to clean it back where um, as the goats were working on the trees and that kind of stuff, they didn't drop something on it and knock the fence down. Um, that is one of the drawbacks with that. Um, hmm. But yes, uh, in that, in, uh, be glad to talk to them a little bit more about that. That unfortunately is one of those ones that we don't have a real uh, uh, tried and true answer to. Um, because it does come down to what that definition, if you think about perimeter fence and what that definition is, uh, is somewhat subjective. And so some fence reviewers and some legal stands might not consider that a permanent fence. One of the key things that I would say if you're doing something like this is make sure that you're using at least some wooden post or good T post. In other words, not just a, the, the lightweight fiberglass post to hold it up. And you're stretching it between some solid points there that give it some more rigidity than it would be like this. This is designed to, to, to uh, quickly pick up and move around. Now, having said that, this is actually the perimeter fence for a group of goats being used on a golf course. Not exactly what I recommend, but I think they got away with it. So Jay, when we, when we think about like folks getting started in livestock and, you know, knowing that we may be very limited when it comes to our budget, are there any sort of strategies that we might think of or even fencing that maybe would be the first kind of, a bit more affordable, a bit more easier to approach, and that before we then over time get more uh, comfortable in our livestock fencing. Yes, I think there is. Um, again, it does come down to a little bit of that, do you have some fence to work off of or something that's sort of causing a perimeter out there to start with? And I go back to the picture that I started with. If you've got something that looks kind of like that, uh, that you can build something to the inside of that actually keeps the animals from pushing against that, but you've got something of a visual barrier there, most animals you can kind of, you, you can 
bluff them into staying where they need to be by doing that and not put so much expense into it. The next step is really things like this, the the temporary fencing, the, the subdivision fencing, um, whether it be the netting like at the top, the poly wire. And the other one that I've seen some folks do a little bit with is um, if you're going to go a little cheaper, how's, yeah, you is to go a little bit better than that and go what they call poly rope, which is the heavier, used a lot for horses, a little bit more expensive, but still much cheaper than, and much more durable long-term, much cheaper than doing a new fence, new high tensile or other fence, but still more, slightly more expensive and much more durable than just the, the, the poly wire to start with and a more substantial fence. Okay. So, so there are options out there. Good, great, yeah. Uh, so Sarah's got a lot of questions. <laughs> so I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all of these, uh, Sarah. Uh, but I, there's, there was one, I'll pick out one, one or two. One of them was, you know, what are some fencing supply companies out there? You know, are there some that like, like with some of the fruit and vegetable growers that we work with, or I work with, there's, there's a couple companies that we usually recommend. Are there similar okay. when it comes to Look, fencing? if you, sorry. No, go ahead. And what about fencing supply companies, I guess? You know, what fencing are some supply companies. If you look at the bottom of the longer fact sheet, okay. that is some of the bigger players in fencing that I'm aware of. Okay. And we'll say we went through and checked the addresses. We had to update a couple of the addresses, okay. but some of those, the addresses have been the same for the last almost 15 years. Because some of them, the, the original fact sheet was written about 15 years ago. And so it's still there. It's, it's, some of those are still there and they are, and, and they're the ones that actually can, depending on what species you work with, they're the ones that can actually provide you with some uh, guidance as to what's a better option for a, a better, less expensive option for external fences, especially on a temporary basis. And then um, I, I'll ask another one of these questions. You know, as we think about just getting started with fencing, I mean, do we, how many helpers are we kind of looking at? Like, are we having to bring in a lot of neighbors for <laughs> getting a fence set up or, you know, in your with, experience, what have you seen? With a little bit of experience or some studying, um, two, some of these fences, two or three, two or three people can do, can put it up pretty quickly. Um, the, the high tensile fence, the one that I showed the long span fencing, that was a gentleman and his son and a four-wheeler. And while I was talking about not that particular fence, but on another location around the corner from that, actually the next fence over from that one, um, we were doing a field day at that. And they were running, they had five lines put up. They had to go back and put the post in, but they had the five lines run in an hour. And we're starting to tighten them up. And in fact, I was I was standing there talking. A couple of us like get caught up in the going on the wrong side of one of the wires. You get you get get to where you kind of understand what you're trying to do. You, you can move pretty fast with it. The biggest piece is getting the post in. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat box at this time. Um, I've made sure that we've I've. Uh, put in the link to your handouts yet again um, in the chat box. And we'll also also send out via email as well, just so everyone has that available. Um, 
So I just want to extend a thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. And also thank you, Jay, for your expertise. I think you said something at the end there. It really hit the nail on the head, which is that a field day for fencing would be very advantageous for, I think, a lot of us. <laughs> so uh, I, I think we will certainly think about that for the, for the spring and summer as we think about our needs for this stuff. So that's one of the things I would say is that in the past, I have done all day workshops on basically some of this fencing and stuff. So fencing and water stuff. So yeah, we can spend a little time on it, but Definitely. I'd love to, love to work with you on that. All right. And that's Jay's email as well that you see on the screen if you have any additional questions.